All right, so today's video is about protists. Now, to help me out today, I have my friend, should I call you doctor? Student doctor. Student doctor, Matt. Bartain. Yes. Hi. Um, so he's going to help me out today. He might, in fact, you know, interject with some medical facts about protists. Yeah, we'll see. So anyway, we've talked about this a bit in the previous unit, but Kingdom Protista was established as a kingdom that included all eukaryotes that did not fit into fungus, plants, or animals. It was kind of a lazy thing to do by these classification scientists. Mm -hmm. um, truth be told, we're not really using, using Kingdom Protista anymore. It's actually in the process of being um, reclassified. And that's because you can't, there's not really a trend among all protists. There's some heterotrophic ones, some autotrophic ones. Um, I mean, that's like a main one that really sets a lot of them apart. Um, there are even some multicellular protists out there, depending on um, who you ask. But the um, here, here's more how all these protists are in the yellow. Here's a phylogenetic tree showing all these different groups of protists and how they relate to the other eukaryotic kingdoms. Maybe that'll give you some perspective on why we're reclassifying the protists. It's sort kingdom. of a big umbrella term mm -hmm. for all the stuff that we haven't figured out how yeah. to connect. Yet. Yes. Yeah. I, I prefer to think that people are just being lazy when they yeah. classify them. That too. Yeah. But um, so we're going to talk a little bit about how protists use different structures in order to, you know, mm -hmm. fulfill their needs for life. So now this right here is a picture of an amoeba. Now amoebas use something called a pseudopod to move. A pseudopod uh, means false foot. Pod means foot. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Right. Yeah. So pseudo so, would be false. The... Yeah. False foot. Um, what it does is, you know, the amoeba is kind of like a blob, and it can project part of its cell forwards to act as like a foot. And it'll sort of create friction ahead and be able to sort of slough the rest of the body forward. Mm -hmm. It's kind of gross looking. But... It is gross looking, but it's an amazing feat of science because mm -hmm. while they're doing that, while they're spreading their arm per se forward, they're also breaking down all of these little intracellular um, microtubules that help create the structure of the organism and then rebuilding them mm. up ahead so yeah. that they can maintain their shape and their structure. Yeah. A lot of stuff going on when they do that. Yeah. Um, some other traits that you see in um, what we used to call the animal-like protists because they move mm -hmm. um, are cilia. Now cilia are little hair-like things on the outside and they, base, they work like a bunch of little propellers all working together on the outside of something. Mm -hmm. Whereas a flagella is one really long structure that waves back and forth and pushes the organism forward. Mm -hmm. um, now there are some protists that don't act, can't actually move on their own. Um, they used to be called the sporozoans, and a lot of parasitic protists fall into this category. Um, we say they use spores. Now a spore is just a thick walled structure that allows that organism to survive. Um, they, re they produce this asexually and generally it's, you know, it is able to spread by being picked up by um, or maybe taken in by an insect vector, mm -hmm. okay? Or even like if it's spreading throughout water, it's just because it can flow through water really easily. Yeah, um, you're thinking uh, in this case when they're creating the spores, they're worried about long-term survival. Mm -hmm. So you can think of it as a bear going into hibernation. So mm -hmm. it'll build up these spores that will be encapsulations of the bug or whatever it is, the, the fungi or whatever. Or not fungus, but... Yeah, in a, this is what we do see. Um, and then they'll be able to survive inclement situations. Mm -hmm. So you think of how it's really cold outside. They can live in that cold environment and then stay viable mm -hmm. until the environment turns nice again. And yeah. then it will start to function as its previous self. It'll break yeah. out of the spore and then become the infectious thing that we know and love. Yep. <laughs> and I, in an earlier video, we actually talked about bacteria doing this as well, and we call that an endospore. Mm -hmm. Similar thing here. Yep. Um, now, the way we're going to talk a little bit about how protists reproduce and also how they impact the environment around them. So they can reproduce asexually and sexually. Mm -hmm. um, so when a protist reproduces asexually, they simply divide you know, by mitosis. And mm -hmm. sometimes we call it a single-celled organism and it divides using mitosis. We call it fission. Just mm -hmm. like in bacteria, we call it binary fission. Um, Looks like someone's at the door. Yeah. It's okay. We can edit this around. <laughs> All right. So when a protist sexually reproduces, they do it through a process called conjugation. And I actually sort of talked about this with uh, bacteria earlier. Okay, it's good. they have specialized structures in which they can transfer genetic material 
from one to another. Mm -hmm. um, they like connect with a specialized structure. Now, some protists show something that's called alternation of generations, and that's when they can have a life stage in which they're haploid, meaning one copy of all their chromosomes, mm -hmm. and one stage where they're diploid, which means two copies of each of the chromosomes. And here's a big picture of uh, water molds and showing how they can alternate through these various stages. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to get into more detail of this uh, when we talk about plants in my class. Perfect. You won't be with us, but... No. Yeah. <laughs> um, but they will be. So here's some ways that protists have an impact on our environment. Now, two terms that we're going to use all the time in our ecology unit are mutualism and parasitism. Mm -hmm. Now, mutualism is when you have a relationship between two organisms and they both benefit from that relationship. Yeah, so you can think of it as the gut flora within your GI tract, how it helps break What's down What's a GI tract? Uh, your gastrointestinal <laughs> tract, so basically everything that you eat through your mouth. Yeah. As it goes through and it's broken down, it's not only broken down by stuff that's naturally made by your body, but also bacteria that's that has grown and sort of seeded into the environment and helps you produce wonderful things like uh, vitamin K, for example. One mm -hmm. of the major vitamins that you need in your body is produced by a bacteria in your intestine. Perfect example of mutualism right mm -hmm. there. So we're going to talk about, about protists uh, and different, well, I only have one example in here, about protists and mutualism. And then another one that protists are very famous for is what's called parasitism. Mm -hmm. now, parasitism is when an organism, one is one benefits while the other is harmed, but generally it is not killed because mm -hmm. that's not really in the best interest of whatever the parasite is because the parasite's kind of living off of that host. Exactly. Um, so first, some uh, mutual, a mutualistic relationship. So um, termites are famous for eating through wood, right? Yeah. Well, the reason they're able to digest the wood is because they have protists living in their gut. It mm -hmm. helps them break down the cellulose. Um, so the protists get food and shelter, and the termites are then able to live in this environment where they can eat wood to survive. They're, mm -hmm. they're, so they're both benefiting from it. Um, another example, coral reefs actually have a lot of algae living in little nooks and crannies. So coral are actually an animal. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason why um, the protists live there is they help actually provide nutrition for the coral. Mm -hmm. And the coral um, will actually give it shelter. So both are benefiting from that relationship. Perfect. Now, here's kind of the, the bad stuff with protists. This is the fun so, stuff. Yes. Do you happen, by the way, you lived in this city. Do you happen to recognize that structure there? Uh, no, I don't. Oh, it's a water tower that's in Milwaukee. Oh, okay. And um, that's the one that broke in the big cryptosporidiosis oh, outbreak that's right, in that's the right. 90s. In the 90s, yep. Yep. So, um, yeah, protists can cause many human diseases. Mm -hmm. um, cryptosporidiosis being one that was a big outbreak. Have you told them about this? This is the first time they're hearing about this. Okay, okay, cool. Do you know, do you know more about it? Yeah, you yeah. lived in Milwaukee for a while, so you might right. be able to. Right. So, um, what cryptosporidium is? It's uh, a parasite that will, in once you ingest it through drinking it in the water, for example, um, it's going to cause profuse watery diarrhea. And actually, this is the bad thing. Um, in in people that are more immunocompromised, meaning people like HIV patients, ones that can't really defend themselves, these can be the big cause of why they die because they will continue to have mm -hmm. diarrhea until they're so dehydrated they die. Yeah. So that's why this is a really bad thing. And you can think of it getting into the water supply of a major metropolitan city mm -hmm. having just terrible public health yeah. repercussions. Yeah, Milwaukee had to totally revamp their entire water purification system because of this. Some other famous ones, Giardia, which I had to avoid when I was backpacking because it yeah, so this one, this one is uh, typically seen in rivers yeah. when you're when you're camping, and in, uh, I think it comes from beaver feces in the water is one of the the yeah. hosts that it lives in. So you yeah. need to be careful when you're drinking water from a from a stream or anything like that. Yeah, I would recommend against it. Yes, um, amoebic dysentery, which uh, our good friend Ken, who they've actually met already, All right, got yeah. once. Yeah, and malaria is one of the biggest diseases worldwide caused by a protist that actually lives in the salivary glands of mosquitoes mm -hmm. and then it's used, uses that mosquito as a vector and it passes it on to a human host. Mm -hmm. um, now this is back to good stuff. Mm -hmm. um, algae is a very diverse group of protists. Now green algae technically, I mean, there's a little debate here. Some people say it's a plant, some people say it's a protist. It, more, it, it shows us just even more how we're kind of at this stage where the way we classify life maybe needs to be re-examined. Mm -hmm. um, but for now, we'll just 
act like they're they kind of cover both categories. Um, there are some like red algae for sure are still considered protists. Yep. Green algae are the one they're more up for debate. But um, so photosynthetic algae can produce a lot of oxygen for the ocean, mm -hmm. um, which you know fish need. And protists also make part of this group that we call plankton, and that's the bottom of the food chain mm -hmm. in every oceanic food chain, and that's extremely important because um, without the bottom of the food chain, what happens? Well, then Nothing's able to look. Yeah. So they call it phytoplankton if it's a photosynthetic algae that is at the bottom Very of that cool. food chain. And then also uh, brown algae, which is considered a protist, mm -hmm. also known as kelp, provides lots of shelter. We actually refer to kelp forests in the ocean. Yeah. Um, and then here's the thing, though. Algae can get out of control when a large amount of sewage gets into some sort of waterway. And that's because I believe it's the nitrogen that... Um, make the algae thrive, mm -hmm. which at first might prov provide a lot more oxygen and stuff for the water, because that's what algae does. Um, so at first this might seem like a good thing, besides the fact that sewage is going into the waterway. But what eventually happens then is bacteria that are able to survive in water will then start eating at all this algae, mm -hmm. and the bacteria, because it needs the oxygen from the water, will de ultimately deprive that area of lots of oxygen. So that's why algal blooms are a really bad thing. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen a lake that's really full of algae? And you notice like the city's trying to clean it up. That's why, because it can really wipe out a lot of life in those areas. Mm -hmm. So, wow, that's actually it. All right. Well, thank you for helping. Hey, no problem. It was great to be here. <laughs> uh, see you later.